Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Terra CRG, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corming Communities, Amtrust, Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., iFunding, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Vienna, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, New York City. Now we're going to become orthopedists. Now we're going to create a hospital, the Hospital for Joint Disease. That's part of the story. And we're going to have our nephews get involved with this Hospital for Joint Disease. But who was my nephew? The nephew grew up in Scarsdale, goes to Tufts, goes to Harvard, Stony Brook, an applied mathematician. Patents, Bell Labs, Helena Full College of Nursing, a philanthropist, my friend Jim Forenthal. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. I'm so glad to be here. We have these wonderful pictures. Tell me about the Forenthals and how they, I think, arrived in Wilkes Bar. I don't know all the details because it was very long ago. It was probably in the 1840s or 1850s. Uh, my great-great-grandfather had 22 children. He did have land, a small amount of it, and was a farmer in near Vienna, but there wasn't enough land to divide amongst all these children, so 11 of them came to the United States, and I'm descended from the branch started by Samuel Frauenthal, my great-grandfather, who was a shoemaker, back when a shoemaker made shoes instead of repairing them. He became prosperous through the purchase and sale of leather as well as through making shoes. Now, his relative, one of his yes. side, didn't go to Pennsylvania but served in the Civil War, you told me. That's right. He, the, the one who served in the Civil War, Max, was a descendant of another of Samuel's brothers who settled in Arkansas, in uh, Heber Falls, Arkansas, and who was then brought into the army for the Confederacy and was apparently the hero of the Battle of Spotsylvania, which is we out have there. No idea. It's somewhere in but Pennsylvania. It was such a great story, I had to bring yeah, it up. So yeah. let's go back to Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay, sure. we have the picture. The, the, the family had this big building mm -hmm. uh, and they were in the boot business or yeah, the shoe, shoe business. But you said to me, he really made more money by, by trading or 
selling leather. He could have maybe been in the tanning business. He might... I, I think maybe he was the one who spoke English the best of the shoemakers. And they, he was sent to New York with a pocket full of money from his own and his colleagues. And he bought and apparently thought he was buying a small amount of leather. And he ended up buying a large amount of leather. And more than they needed, and it was sold back off, and so he ended up prosperous from this, but didn't trust banks. I guess that was typical at the time. So he put the money in trunks in the attic of his house in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. So let's now go to the uncles. Okay. Tell me about them, well, his sons. His sons, one of whom was my grandfather. He was one of nine children. Uh, I think there were six boys and three girls. And he was Herman Frauenthal, my grandfather, and his brother Henry Frauenthal. Both attended Lehigh. One was an, uh, an electrical engineer, my grandfather. The other was an analytic chemist, my great uncle. And they then decided that they wanted to study medicine. Henry was a little bit older, went to New York, studied medicine. And Where did you go to medical school? You know, I don't actually know, but um, they both went to the same medical school. If there was one at Bellevue, yeah, that's I where think it was. It, what they, they probably yeah. went to the Bellevue Medical School, yeah. which really was NYU from right. the origins. R yes. So they went to Bellevue because they have a Bellevue involvement later That's on. right. They certainly st learned orthopedics at Bellevue, and whether that was a continuation or not, things were a little different in those days. My father mentioned that or told me that it was unusual for a doctor to first get an undergraduate degree and then go to medical school, as people do today. In a lot of places in Europe, people just go straight to medical school. And Henry and Herman both first studied, uh, got bachelor's degrees, then went to medical school, and then but, continued but, but on. But orthopedics was, into a, new orthopedics. It was, was a new, con a new, new business, new right. uh, because it really came out when the X-ray was created in yes. like 1847, the first X-ray. Exactly. So that's what happened. So the, we have the two brothers. Who were at Bellevue, and what happens next? Well, they decided that they were going to start their own little business. And by this time, my grandfather was married to my grandmother, and she was from a prosperous family, a, the Rothschild family. The L.F. Rothschild. L.F. Rothschild family, Frank Rothschild's children. And there were a number of brownstones on the Upper East Side, up by Mount Morris Park, which is now Marcus Garvey No, but originally they Park. started their infirmary uh, in, on, on Lexington, Lexington Avenue, Avenue in a couple of brownstones. Right, and then they moved to four adjacent brownstones on 125th off Madison, and that became the dispensary that eventually grew into a city block and was called the hospital, or is now called the Hospital for Joint Diseases. Now it's really called the NYU Langone Hospital for that's, Joint Diseases. That's right. But at that time, when they created it, Jewish doctors couldn't get into hospitals, so they created, and they got a charter yeah. from the state, yeah. they created the Jewish Hospital for, for Deformities and, joint disease. and jo joint disease. And in those days, orthopedics was primarily dealing with polio, braces and uh, crutches and other uh, devices to help people who were debilitated by polio to get around. And they also set bones, and my grandfather was interested in using plaster to stabilize bones after they'd been set. And this was 1905. Th they started in they 1905. They started in 1905 over there. They subsequently developed to the larger hospital. What year was the larger hospital built? Well, it was built in stages, but by the 1930s, it was pretty much a whole city block. Your great uncle was right. on the Titanic. Yes. Tell me the story, because there was this article that we found about your, your uncle that the crewman walked over to Jacob Astor, John Jacob Astor and yep. said, leave the ship. But, and he said, no way. Uh, my grandfather, my great uncle, Henry Frauenthal, the orthopedist, had been married. He was about 50 at the time in Europe to Clara Heinzheimer. And the best man, I assume, was traveling with them. That was another of the brothers, Isaac. I assume Herman was probably still back in New York 
running the hospital because it was a good startup business. And so Henry and Isaac were, were there. Henry and his wife were in the stateroom and Isaac was out walking around and heard the first mate or the captain tell John Jacob Astor that the boat had hit an iceberg and it was in trouble and people should uh, evacuate. And Astor's reaction was, Boats like this don't sink. This was the unsinkable Titanic. Uh, Widener, Harry Widener, who's, you know, for whom the Harvard Library is named, also drowned because they didn't want to go out into the North Atlantic in the freezing cold on April the 15th, now, now, 1912. Now, in the article, so, it yeah. said Uncle weighed about 250 pounds, and he broke a couple of people's bones when he jumped into the boat. I, I'm not convinced that's true actually, only that I'm the fattest of all the Frauenthals and I weigh a good deal less than 250 pounds. So he comes back. And I'm taller than Henry was. Okay, so, so Henry comes back yes. and Henry and Herman. Henry, Henry and Isaac uh, and Clara uh, move, move quickly. They believed what they'd heard and they went and got into a lifeboat and unfortunately that lifeboat was launched half empty. But they survived and were rescued by the Carpathia uh, and you know, Henry, Henry wrote about this subsequently because the fact that men had survived when so many people died was troubling to, to a lot of people. But they were simply acting on the information that came to them and were wise enough to leave. So let's fast forward. It's okay. the 30s when the new hospital is built up, yep. up on Mount Morris Avenue and 121st, 122nd mm -hmm. Street. And... The history was your father, uh, who was a stockbroker, right. uh, who originally was trained as an architect, but yep. during the war... It was really the Depression, not the, the, war, depression, the depression. Not the war. During the Depression, it was smarter to be in a business that huh. you can earn a living. Exactly. He needed to earn a living. He was married to my mother. They married in 1936, and so he started working with his Uncle Lou Rothschild, L.F. Rothschild, and was what was then called a $2 broker. He basically executed trades for customers and really spent the rest of his career in, on working on Wall Street. Now, reading through the history of the Florenthals, mm -hmm. they were always involved with the hospital. Yes. Your father was on the board also? Yes, he was. Lou was. Herman Jr., my father, was on the board. And in 1971, my brother was elected to the board. And then my you brother, were, Stephen, and, and then in 1976, I, was, I joined the oh, board we're gonna of forward. joint diseases. So now let's talk about yeah. your parents are living in Scarsdale. Right. Your brother is like was five years older than you. Tell me about growing up in Scarsdale. Well, uh, it, of course, we only get to grow up once, and so I don't know what it would have been like to grow up elsewhere or somewhere else, but it was wonderful. I, I had a, a really delightful childhood. There were lots of adults around, and there was always sailing and skiing and mountain climbing and summer camp, and it was a very good you, life. Very few people say, you know, yes. when you're a kid, I want to become an applied mathematician. I want to write uh, the programming for the first computer. How, how did this come about? Well... I mean, Dad was a $2 broker. Yeah, you know, all. you could have been in the... You could have maybe followed the tradition of the trader of leather... Yeah, or you right. could have been in the business of trying to become an orthopedist. Yeah. How was applied mathematics? Well, uh, the word dyslexia hadn't been invented, or at least nobody had heard it. I had a great trouble reading. I was not a very good student in high school. And so my parents were kind enough not to encourage me to go on and study science and medicine. And, and, and then I got to college Discovered, now, how, yes, but, but as we okay. said, with yeah. going to college, I, I, I thought I was your father, be a stockbroker. Didn't like they my want father. you to go to Lehigh? To they wanted me to go to Lehigh because that was the family school. The father had gone to NYU. Uh, I went to Boston, saw the Tufts campus early one October morning, and the trees were turned, and the hill was beautiful, and I decided that was where I wanted to go. So, but, but there when I you was. went to Tufts, when you started Tufts, did you think it was applied mathematics? Yeah. I walked into the engineering building because I'd been sort of tracked toward engineering because the advisor at Scarsdale High figured I didn't have to read as much if I was studying math and physics and chemistry. And there was a room called the Computer Center. 
I didn't understand that the paint was still wet on the door. The computer arrived at Tufts the same year I did, but I just assumed colleges had computers and high schools didn't. And I went in, made friends with the guy who was running it, and was pretty soon advising and teaching other people how to write computer programs and really used that as my way through uh, both Tufts and Harvard. I was able to solve problems no one else could because I was using computers that hadn't existed before. You graduate yeah. Tufts. Yeah. How do you go to? How do you decide on Harvard? Well, um, I I love the Boston area. I had done very well. I graduated first in my class from Tufts, and so I could sort of go wherever I wanted. And those were good times. I had a National Science Foundation fellowship for four years that paid all the expenses and supported me. And I decided that I wanted to just go down the road to Cambridge and live there. I talked my closest friend, who has been my closest friend since junior high school and still is today, into coming. And we, we established an apartment in Cambridge. And uh, you know, both of us went and got PhDs at Harvard. Stony Brook? Went to Stony Brook soon after because I concluded that I wanted to be a professor. I had been very influenced by my professors, and I decided that it was something that was interesting. But how, and how it was do you decide on Stony this. Brook? Well, you spent all this time up in Boston, yeah. you know? Well, I guess as is always the case, you pick the best opportunity, and the best opportunity came from Stony Brook. You may recall in 1971 or 72, about the time I finished my PhD, the United States decided not to build the supersonic transport. Boeing was going to build the competitor to the Concorde, and they decided not to do it. Though times were complex then, both politically and socially, and there were not a lot of opportunities for somebody in applied math slash engineering like me, and I got a very nice offer from Stony Brook. Now, had you met Margaret at this time? I had met Margaret. I was already married. I met Margaret in 1966 when I finished college. And Margaret and came from where? Margaret was from Chile, from Temuco, Chile, and she came to the United States. When, she had American parents, and so it was time for her to go to college, and her parents sent her to where they had come from, which was South Carolina, and she didn't like it, pretty quickly discovered that she would like the Northeast better, and so she came to Boston and was living in Boston and actually working at Harvard when we met. So, so you take this woman who was born in Chile, yep. and you, you move to Stony Brook, Long yep. Island. Yep. And how many years do you spend at Stony Brook? I was there for uh, about eight years. As a professor? Uh, as a, I was an associate professor. professor I was given tenure. tenure after the first year. And I was popular with the students because I was an effective teacher. I won the thing called the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. And um, was pretty happy doing that. But the the situation in the country sort of conspired against my staying. I could have stayed, but there was a lot of inflation, as you may recall, and the professors were not treated terribly well by the state legislature. We were getting minuscule raises while the cost of living was going up. I was still young and energetic enough that I could leave, and so I left. So, so how do you find your first real job besides teaching? Well, everybody said Bell Laboratories was the premier place to go if you were a physical scientist, an applied mathematician, a physicist, a chemist. And, and so I looked into it, interviewed, and was offered a job. And so but well, now you I moved, moved to New, to New Jersey. Jersey. And, it, and at Bell, what are you involved with? Well, I started off doing applied math. I mean, that was why they hired me. I built mathematical models of telephone traffic, how calls are queued waiting to go to an operator, how they flow through the trunking that covered the United States at the time, and I designed algorithms for how to distribute calls and found this really very satisfying, very interesting. But like 
other people who work in industry, uh, the opportunity to move up within the organization presented itself. And so I took it and that in, caused me to move to a somewhat different area. And that was? And that was sound quality and echo control. And I became expert in that, managing a group of people who were working in it. Would you explain yeah. what do you mean by echo control? Well, when you speak in, on a telephone connection, uh, you sometimes hear a strong echo of your own voice and it comes back into your ear and it's very distracting. And the things that cause it are the amount of time your voice is delayed coming back to you. The more it's delayed, the, the worse the echo. And how loud the signal is. And because of the way modern telephony works, both voice over the internet and cell phone telephony, there's more delay than there used to be. And so echo has become an increasingly acute problem. And I spent a good deal of time dreaming up ways to control echo. And you also did, you did a number of patents. I, and, I, and I wrote patents for these ideas. I had by then moved from Bell Laboratories to Cisco Systems. Cisco Systems encouraged the people who knew about how to make a telephone network to come there because they were going into the telephone business. And I had this wonderful job where I was sort of the, the final arbiter of echo problems. Other people were very good at dealing with them in the network with customers, but sometimes there were situations that arose that nobody knew how to deal with, and so I got to do my research, my thought so process. So what, what you that. told me, how many, you have a number of I've patents. Over, uh, more than a dozen patents, and most of which have to do with controlling echo in either uh, voice over the internet calls or the, the hardest of all situations, which is conference calls. The echo comes from the far end, and if there are a lot of far ends, there's more opportunity for echo. So how many years did you spend at uh, Cisco? I was there for about a decade. And then? And then, uh, tragically, my, my wife Margaret died, and I decided that what I needed to do was to make some changes in my life. I didn't want to, but they had happened. But, so let's, I, but part of yes. your life, yes. a good portion of your life, and your late brother, Stephen, mm -hmm is that, as you said, your brother got involved with the Hospital for Joint Disease in yes. 1971, yep. and you got involved with the Hospital for Joint Disease in 1974. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Hospital for Joint Disease was thinking of moving to a different location. A different location, okay. right. And at that time, the Hospital for Joint Disease had an involvement with a nursing school. It actually had started that nursing school. In 1945, I like to think of sort of Rosie the Riveter. Women had more opportunities, and so it was increasingly difficult to attract nurses, particularly during World War II. And so joint diseases started its own little internal program to train practical nurses to work at the hospital. In the intervening 70, 71 years, that little program has grown into a fully chartered and accredited college. So you're on the board of Joint Disease, mm -hmm. and Joint Disease finds a piece of land on 17th Street and 2nd right. Avenue, right. where they are going to originally have an affiliation with Beth, Beth Israel. Israel. That's right. And we build a building, uh, opened in 1979, but there was also a community hospital that was part of joint diseases that was then named the Joint Diseases North General Hospital that kept in the old building and the nursing school stayed there because it had facilities in the old building, the one that was subsequently torn down but that we referred to as you know fully f between 124th and 125th between Madison and Park. And then North General builds a new hospital. That's right. They made a deal with the state of New York to build a new hospital on land that was vacant at 122nd Street in Madison. When the hospital, the new hospital was fully constructed, they moved the patients from the old hospital to the new one both uptown, and then they signed paper to transfer the ownership of the land under the hospital, so the state got the 
space under the old hospital and the hospital, the North General Hospital, got the space under the new uptown hospital. So at this time, you and your brother are involved both on the Joint Disease Hospital yes. and also on the, on the Helena Fold College of Nursing. That's correct. And o over the years, the, the relationship Beth Israel doesn't work out. What happened over well, there? Well, Beth Israel didn't work out for, for a variety of reasons that um, were more probably political than anything else. Uh, I don't know all the details of that, but the more uh, serious problem was the, the tension between the uptown Joint Diseases North General and the downtown Joint Diseases Orthopedic Institute. Because of the separation of assets, the community hospital uptown um, was, was at odds with the orthopedic hospital downtown, and it became impossible really to serve on both boards. I started on both boards. My intention was to stay on both, but it became a conflict. And since the family history was with orthopedics, I stayed with the Orthopedic Institute downtown on their board, but my brother had more or less single-handedly kept the nursing program running uptown, and so I asked him could I join the uptown advisory board for the nursing school, and he was happy to so, have so me. So let's talk a little bit about the nursing school. Yes. It was founded in 1945. Yep. And it was founded really for as a RN program, a two-year nursing uh, originally a practical nursing and then fairly quickly it became an RN program and uh, Felix Fold, Leonard Felix Fold, was a patient at joint diseases and was concerned about the welfare of the young women who were students there and gave some money which then led to the naming of the uptown nursing school as the Helene Fold School was of that, Nursing. Was that his wife or his mother? Uh, his, it, actually, Helene Fold was his mother. He was a Wall Street trader who had done very well, and he and his sister had a foundation, and they used money to benefit the things that interested his, his mother, which included nursing and public health. Now, tell me, the, the school has won a distinction. A couple of years ago, the school... Uh, started a BS program. That's right. About 2007, it became fully independent of the hospital with which it had been affiliated, and a couple of years later, that hospital entered bankruptcy. So it was fortunate that it was freestanding, and it uh, had been giving an associate degree in applied science, essentially a two-year degree, and but it did it in one year, and it took as its entry class licensed practical nurses and graduated them as registered nurses. So when do you join? Now, what about the, 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 the degree program, the acknowledgement that they just got well, in the top program? Uh, in August, the Helene Fold College of Nursing was identified as the number one community college in the United States by an organization that looks at the value of the education. It looks at the cost, the tuition. It looks at the, whether students who enroll graduate, and it looks at whether the graduates get good jobs. And based on that, comparing the college against 821 community colleges in the United States, it was rated the top one, which is pretty amazing, actually. So, so it's really interesting that the professor Mm -hmm. has truly followed his goal and became the chairman of the board Yes, and has done a great job. And I think the Frohenthal family, the Rothschild family, and all the rest, you know, has a great history, and I'm happy to know you and happy to be involved and previously served with you on both the Joint Disease Board and the uh, Helena Fold, Fold Board. College yes, of Nursing. Yes. And thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, Michael. It was a pleasure.